So my goal in this talk is to introduce uh, some, uh, a class of methods from numerical analysis, which we believe could be quite useful uh, for certain inference problems. Um, and the, the problem we are interested in is given here. Uh, we have some state y, uh, which is governed by a differential equation in time. And that's, so that's the right-hand function, right-hand side function f, which is our model, which it depends on parameters theta. Uh, we are given some observed data for y, and we want to learn the parameters theta, which are compatible with that data. And um, this is obviously a very standard problem in all sorts of fields of uh, mathematical biology and throughout uh, science. Um, we usually solve this problem by imposing some kind of likelihood, um, and then the classical approach would be to maximize that likelihood. Uh, the Bayesian approach would be to additionally specify prior and uh, infer the posterior distribution of the parameters. I'm going to assume that that's fairly standard uh, to this audience. I want to open the talk uh, with a couple of the, the kind of key challenges that we think this problem has uh, versus uh, inference problems not involving differential equations. So firstly, uh, each uh, we, we can't assume that there's any analytical solution to the differential equation. And instead, we're going to have to solve it using a numerical approximation. Um, and in inference, it's not just a single numerical approximation, but a whole sequence of them at a sequence of parameter values which are proposed by whatever inference algorithm we are using. Uh, we do have access to fairly clever solvers, which are going to use uh, the local truncation error to try and to, to choose the step size. Um, but there's no guarantees that the, a control of the local truncation error will necessarily control error in the, in the likelihood. Um, so kind of as an example of what can go wrong for that reason uh, is illustrated here. I've taken data of an action potential, and then I'm getting the likelihood from the beeler reuter action potential model. Uh, I've first solved that uh, using a really tight tolerance, a 10 to the minus 10, which is indicated in gray. Um, and that should be a, a, for, for a range of values of the sodium conductance with all, the, with all, all other parameters held at plausible values. Um, so that should be a pretty accurate picture of what the likelihood slice looks like. But if you relax the tolerance on the solver too much, uh, such as up to 10 to the minus 3, which is indicated in red, you start to see that the, that's, that likelihood surface has become shifted in parameter space uh, away from the kind of true point. And additionally, and perhaps more perniciously, uh, the, the surface now has some sort of jaggedness on it. And that's because at different parameter values, uh, the adaptive solver uses different uh, uh, grids and without guarantee of, of any oops any uh, error control on the likelihood you can see these kind of discontinuities appearing in the likelihood surface and obviously that kind of surface is going to uh, cause trouble for any kind of inference algorithm such as MCMC because uh, they're going to get stuck in little spikes as opposed to moving throughout the whole space. So we are not the first to notice this problem. Um, the field of probabilistic numerics in the last couple of years has been trying to kind of propose techniques that, that address some of these problems. I don't have time to give like a detailed account of this, but I want to mention a couple of ideas that have emerged from here. Um, one idea is to basically model the solution to the differential equation as a Gaussian process. And then instead solving consists of updating your beliefs about that, um, getting a posterior distribution for the, um, the solution. And that can be incorporated into uncertainty for parameter inference. Um, another idea is to inject some kind of uh, noise term of an appropriately chosen magnitude at each solver time step. And again, that's going to give you a distribution uh, of uh, solutions which can be uh, used to, to characterize the uncertainty uh, that's arising from the numerical approximation. Uh, but we, we think that there's perhaps a, an alternative way to deal with some of these challenges, which is what I'll present in this talk in a second. Um, the second problem I, I want to raise about, or the second challenge I want to raise, is that even when you get your numerics correct, and even when you have a, an accurate likelihood surface, it's probably not going to be very friendly. So this is a, a two-dimensional slice of the likelihood from the Goodwin oscillator. Uh, it's solved uh, I've taken it from this paper, it's solved completely accurately. All of those spikes are the actual shape of the likelihood itself. And obviously, this is going to be a very challenging service to interrogate for uh, any kind of simplistic inference algorithm. Our best hope for, for moving efficiently around that space is to incorporate gradient information. Uh, but that gradient information for differential equations is not available uh, that easily. Um, the most naive way to do that would be to do finite differences, but that obviously is going to scale really poorly with the size of the, with the number of parameters, because 
if to, to get a gradient with finite differences, you'd be sitting at one location in parameter space, having to do one extra solve for each parameter, which could potentially take ages. So I want to present um, an alternative approach that should address both of these challenges. It turns out that for any, um, for any forward model and any likelihood, you can, we can derive another system, which for reasons which are related to linear algebra is called the adjoint system. So this is another, the adjoint, the solution to the system, that, which I call phi, the adjoint state, um, it occurs in the same, it's, it's on the same time interval as the, the forward solution y, um, it's of the same, phi is of the same dimension as y, and once we've obtained phi, it contains a lot of useful information. Namely, it contains information about the error in the log likelihood uh, because we use a numerical approximation to the forward solution. Uh, we propose to use that information to adapt the grid and make sure that we're using a solver grid for the forward problem that's accurate enough for inference. Uh, additionally, it contains information about the gradient of the likelihood with respect to the parameters. And so we propose to use that to drive the more, more sophisticated inference algorithms, such as uh, Hamiltonian Monte Carlo or the no u ensemble. So fortunately for you all, I do recognize that this talk is not the, the place to do a, a kind of line-by-line -line derivation of these methods. Um, but I do want to give, just for those who are interested, a sort of brief overview of, of what the adjoint system is and, and where it comes from and how it provides these two uh, very useful quantities. Um, so we are interested in, in quantities of interest which depend on the solution y, so that's capital Q. These are functionals of the, the solution over time, so an integral of some little q over the time being considered. Um, it's fairly easy to express all of the usual likelihoods uh, in this format. This is just the sum of squared errors objective function, and it should be obvious how likelihoods such as IID Gaussian uh, can also be written in a similar way. And what we want to find is that EQ, which is the error in Q, so the Q evaluated at the true hypothetical true solution minus Q evaluated at this numerical approximation. And I would note this is not just the magnitude of the error, but it's the actual error itself, including the direction, which is potentially useful. Um, we're going to do a, start with the first order Taylor expansion of Q about y hat. Uh, we get moving zero to inside the integral, we get something like this. We can't um, actually evaluate this because we don't know why, but it's going to be tractable via integration by parts, for which we need the the derivative of the first term in time, and that's our second approximation, an expansion of the right-hand side, also about y hat. Um, plugging that in and, and working through the, the algebra of it, we get that the eq is given by this integral in the box. Um, it's the right-hand side evaluated at the numerical approximation minus the time derivative of the numerical approximation. We have both of those very easily, and multiplied by this state phi, which is the, the adjoint state that I mentioned before. And here is the equation that phi must obey for this to hold. Um, it should be a fairly easy equation to solve because it's linear in phi. Um, and like I said before, phi is of the same dimension as y. So one extra solve, and then we can just evaluate that integral pretty easily, get the error. Um, another point I want to make is that this integral need not be computed all the way from zero to capital T. We can, we can calculate it cumulatively on each segment of the uh, solution grid, and that tells us the contribution to the error in the likelihood that's arising over time. And so that's obviously the most useful information for refining the grid, uh, because we know which, which areas of the grid are causing too much error. That's where we can refine which areas uh, are fine, uh, are decent enough, and then we can de-refine and move to a more uh, efficient grid. So secondly, also I'll try and keep this brief, just for the gradient, um, just a kind of an argument based on if we, we're going to move theta by delta theta and then try and do like delta Q over delta theta. Um, the Z is going to be the kind of perturbation to the OD solution because we, we've changed the parameters slightly. The derivative of, of Q with respect to theta is going to look like that, moving the derivative inside the integral. Um, again, we can't solve that as it is because we don't know Z, but we can derive... Um, uh, the time derivative of z, again, this, we can use integration by parts, expand the right-hand side uh, in two parameters, um, z and theta, y and theta, and then uh, plug that in, work through the integration, we end up with this uh, box expression. And uh, again, dft theta, that's, we have to you know, calculate that from the right-hand side, but we should be able to do that, and multiply it by the same quantity phi. And this is the same adjoint state phi uh, that, that serves us in, in determining the error in Q. Uh, so it's, it's fantastically convenient that by doing this one extra adjoint solve, we can then get both of these quantities on um, the, the error and the gradient. So um, 
just in case I, I've lost anyone, I'll try and bring you back into the fold with a kind of summary of what I've, I've, I'm proposing with zero equations. Um, at each value of the parameters theta, which is proposed by our inference algorithm as it moves around, uh, we first solve the forward problem uh, to obtain some approximate numerical solution by hat. Uh, using the methods I just described, we can then solve the adjoint problem to obtain phi, uh, evaluate the two expressions that I've I provided to obtain both the error and the gradient. Um, if the error exceeds some threshold, uh, we can refine the grid, and that's I, we do that you know, based on the kind of cumulative calculation of error as I just described. Um, if the error, if it seems good enough, then we'll use the gradient, this approximate gradient, to drive uh, no U-turn sampler or HMC or some similar sophisticated gradient-based sampler. Um, an obvious question here is how uh, much error can we tolerate? on the log likelihood before this is going to work. And a slightly tangential but, but quite relevant uh, line of research has been looking at uh, the base factors between uh, some sort of theoretical posterior distribution based on the true solution and the numerical posterior distribution based on the approximate solution. And the, this, this paper I've cited at the bottom kind of worked through that analysis based on traditional error control of the local truncation error. Um, the results based on our approach where you can control error in the uh, log likelihood directly is a lot simpler. In order for that base factor to be not to be exceed one plus b, we need to keep that eq less than b, the magnitude. Um, this is yeah, and so so obviously as the base factor tends to one, then those two postures are going to be considered fairly equivalent. In practice, I, I've I've found that setting that kind of threshold to 1.01, .01, so in other words, a, a maximum error in the, of of eq of uh, one in a hundred uh, works practically very well. So uh, to present uh, some results, this is a model that we found very useful uh, for trialing these methods. It's a damped and driven oscillator. Uh, we've got two kind of dynamical parameters, k and c, the damping constant and the spring constant. Then it's forced by f of t. We've got five parameters there, which specify the magnitude of the forcing function over time. Um, additionally, we're going to be trying to learn the noise magnitude in the data sigma. So we've got a total of eight parameters to learn. So a fairly high dimensional problem, uh, but not drastically. I'll initialize it at zero, but give it a bit of a kick on the, the first derivative as our initial condition. Um, I'm going to run inference using two kind of different strategies. As our comparator methods, what I've called traditional, we're just going to use the, the standard solvers, uh, which control the local truncation error. Um, and then for inference, we are not going to assume access to any gradient information, so we're going to run adaptive covariance, which is a, a fairly powerful uh, MCMC sampler that does not depend on the gradient. And then we're going to compare that to the method that I've just proposed, which I've called adjoint, uh, which is uh, controlling the error in the log likelihood and then using nuts for the inference. The first result I want to look at is uh, the sort of dependence of these methods on the tolerance. So this is the last half of 10,000 MCMC samples applied to that problem. Uh, this is the traditional method, two different choices of the tolerance. At 10 to the minus 3, you're starting to see some of those problems that I d identified at the beginning of the talk. The five different chains there are not converging to the same kind of posterior distribution. They're, they're not terrible, and they're in the correct region, but they're not actually hitting the true posterior. Once you refine the tolerance down to 10 to the minus 5, you can see that the method is working. Um, on the other hand, this is the, the same uh, experiment, but for the adjoint method. And the tolerance here now applies directly on the log likelihood. And so you can see that that greatly simplifies it, avoids having to kind of fine tune that. Um, we just set the 10 to the minus 2 on the log likelihood, and it works fine. It's the same as 10 to the minus 3, and that it honestly would, would work for any tolerance up to 10 to the minus 2. Um, so next, I want to study the, the actual performance of entrance. Um, I'm just going to introduce a, a kind of third comparator method here, the mixed method, uh, which uh, adapts the, which solves the, the, the differential equation using the traditional way, but then solves the adjoint equation and uses that for nuts. And this kind of allows us to isolate the, the effects of the two different innovations here. Um, what I'm plotting here is the effective sample size over time as the MCMC chains are uh, a run for this problem. And starting with the traditional approach in red, it is working, but it, as you can see, it's going very slowly. Um, that's because adaptive covariance is really not powerful enough to handle this eight dimensional posterior distribution. Um, looking at the, the adjoint method and the, the mixed method, we see obviously a significant advantage in the, the performance of inference um, in terms of effective samples. Um, in general, adjoint 
tends to outperform the mixed method, although not drastically, there's a significant overlap there. But really that, what that suggests is that we can do this more principled error control on the log likelihood without any real extra cost. Um, so it certainly simplifies avoiding having to, to ever set a tolerance up front, and it's not going to hurt us and it might even help us. So a couple of directions for, for future work. The results I've presented are based on uh, standard Runge cutter solvers. It would be interesting to apply these methods to the more sophisticated solvers, uh, BDF, Adams Moulton, and so forth. In principle, it should all work, and that would enable this to be applicable to you know more more kind of high performance problems. Um, grid refinement, we are currently doing that very simplistically, uh, just by adding data points where the error exceeds some threshold and removing them where it seems good enough. There's a lot of information in the error estimate that we have that arguably could be, be used, I, I suspect, to develop a, a more sophisticated strategy for refining the grid. And I would expect that that could really increase the performance and perhaps push the, um, the adjoint really above the mix in this type of results. Um, and then, needless to say, it would be interesting to, to find some kind of challenging biological differential equations where we could trial some of these methods. Um, and then finally, uh, just to thank the collaborators in this project, uh, Martin Robinson and, and Dave Gavigan, in Oxford's computer science department, uh, Ben Lambert at the University of Exeter, Chon Lei at, over in the University of Macau, and then Simon Tavener at Colorado State. Um, so thanks to them for all their contributions, and I would happily take any questions. Um, thank you, Richard. Oh, we have questions. Thank you for the talk. This is very nice. I'm noticing that what you've gotten here is uh, bound on the error of the log likelihood and then an estimate of the gradient. Would it be either pos possible or worthwhile to get an estimate on the error of the gradient yes, yeah. that you're going to be using in nuts? Or That's, that is something we've thought about. And yeah, that would absolutely be an interesting direction to take this. Um, because arguably, the you can tolerate more of inaccuracy in the gradient if your, say, your, your posterior surface is more uh, tight, uh, more, more curved. Um, whereas it, as that starts to get more shallow, you could use a, you need a more precise gradient. And so that could arguably lead to kind of performance advantages. So yes, that's, that's absolutely an, an excellent idea and something we are interested in looking at next. Uh, so I'm wondering, uh, do you think this method would extend um, easily to PDE models instead of ODEs? In principle, yes. Um, adjoint methods work great for partial differential equations. I think the, the challenge is that you know, inference for partial differential equations is obviously so much more expensive that I would be curious to see a problem where you would be running like a full MCMC chain uh, like, like you're doing here. And, but in principle, certainly these methods would apply to partial differential equations, yes. Thank you. Um, I guess one of the challenges um, in the, the um, image of the likelihood surface that you showed from the Ben Caldhead paper is that it's very spiky and multimodal. Mm. Um, and one of the problems with gradient-based methods of MCMC is that they, they get stuck in local modes. Um, have you looked at any problems where that's the case and does your approach improve inference for those sorts of problems as well? No, I, I think that's kind of a separate issue, to be honest. Um, I, I absolutely agree, but I think, yeah, you, you may want to look at a more efficient MCMC samplers to handle that. And if those samplers needed great information, this would be a way to provide that to them. But yeah, I think that, that, that as I say, I don't see this helping that uh, by itself. Maybe it could help in the sense that it provides the great information efficiently and quickly so that you could have enough time to, to run one of those more sophisticated samplers. Um, yeah, I was just thinking about that actually, just following on, I think, from, from uh, the question over there, which is that I suspect that in order to get the error in the gradient, you'd probably have to get the second derivative and so in the log likelihood. And so that was one of the key things about Calderhead's paper is that the use, usefulness of the second derivatives of the log likelihood, because then that tells you how, to, how far to step, essentially. So maybe it would be a useful byproduct, I don't know. Yeah, thank you for your great talk. Um, I'm fortunate enough to have heard it the second time now. <laughs> so I'm just going to ask the same question again and, and see. <laughs> sure. Um, 
So I still don't really understand. So one thing I don't understand, and maybe you have uh, an intuition about this, is in order to estimate the error and also the gradients, to some extent you rely on being able to compute the adjoint accurately. But you need to solve another differential equation for the adjoint in order to obtain these adjoints. So do you have any intuition why? I mean, obviously, it seems to work really well, but I, I still don't know why the adjoint seems to be less sensitive to these numerical solution errors. So you can actually control the error of your other ODE. Yeah, so I think we have just discussed this before, as you say. I think you, you are right. There is a regime here. Um, if your, your kind of initial grid is so bad, you will get to the point that the adjoint is not solved accurate enough, and this is all going to break down. So it is important to, to kind of start with a grid that is good enough that this is going to uh, work. We've studied uh, empirically quite extensively the kind of accuracy of these es estimates, and they do work really well in practice. Um, kind of theoretically, you know, I, I have been thinking about this, and it strikes me that the, probably the best way to handle this is to do your solves using embedded runger cutter methods so that you do get an estimate of local truncation error as well, but not use that local truncation error to actually do any ad adaptation, but use it as a safety check to make sure that both your forward solution and your adjoint solution are within some sort of safe regime where, where all this should work. Um, so that's kind of, if you were very concerned about that, I think that using the embedded methods would be the best way to handle that. Thank you. And you don't think there's like uh, some kind of uh, line of argument that s tells us that maybe the adjoints are better behaved for whatever reason? There's no guarantee of that. Uh, they, they could go either way. They, they could be nicer, but they, it is possible to construct ones which are nastier. Um, so you, it's going to be completely problem dependent, and that is something to pay attention to. Yeah, great, thanks. Thank you. Uh, we have a question online. Do you have, sorry, do you have a sense of which types of problems this would work best on? Yes, yes. I think uh, challenging problems. Um, this is not going to be worthwhile for like logistic growth. Um, it's high dimensional problems where the r bothering to do the adjoint uh, equation and getting the gradient kind of pays off. And also problems where the forward solution is kind of difficult and some sort of fairly well adapted grid is necessary. And then again, that's going to motivate uh, you know, developing a, a, a sort of highly adapted grid as opposed to just uniform. So basically challenging problems and problems with lots of parameters. There's this another sub question from the same person. Um, sure. And when it might not work so well? It might not, okay. Well, I mean, like I just said, simple, simple problems, problems which are easy to solve. There's just no point bothering. There's a, there's extra expense here in terms of computational cost. And if the, I'm sure there are easy enough problems where it's really not going to be worthwhile. So, um, do we have any final questions? OK, uh, if not, um, thank you once again.